Over the last decade, endobronchial ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration has rapidly become the standard for histologic sampling of mediastinal lymph nodes. This video will describe the technique for performing EBUS FNA and will highlight procedures that will optimize specimen yield and improve staging accuracy. There are currently three manufacturers of EBUS bronchoscopes, Olympus, Pentax, and Fujifilm. All three scopes share similar design and feature a flexible bronchoscope with an integrated linear ultrasound array at the distal end. A working channel allows passage of a flexible biopsy needle which, once deployed, exits the end of the scope at an oblique angle to the scope axis. A light source and fiber optic are also present at the distal end of the scope, proximal to the ultrasound transducer, and are oriented in the same forward oblique plane as the biopsy channel. The degree of off-axis view varies between as little as 10 degrees for the Fuji scope to as much as 45 degrees in the Pentax model. A disposable balloon is placed over the ultrasound transducer, which is filled with saline in order to optimize acoustic coupling with the wall of the airway. The procedure may be performed either with sedation and topical anesthetics or under general anesthesia. We prefer the use of total intravenous general anesthesia using propofol infusion and short-acting narcotics and muscle relaxants, as this results in a quiet operative field, ensures adequate ventilation, and is more comfortable for patients. Use of a laryngeal mask airway allows examination of the vocal cords and the higher paratracheal stations, which may be difficult to visualize using an endotracheal tube. However, patients at risk of aspiration, those requiring high airway pressures, and patients with a history of supraglottic tumors or neck irradiation may be better served with a standard endotracheal tube. A size 8.5 or 9 endotracheal tube or size 4 or 5 laryngeal mask airway is required for EBUS to allow sufficient collateral airflow around the bronchoscope to maintain ventilation. The procedure begins with an endobronchial examination using an adult bronchoscope to rule out occult endobronchial disease and to clear secretions which may impair visualization when using the EBUS scope. Remember, the tip of the EBUS scope lies below the forward view of the scope. Thus, when traversing the vocal cords, the scope must be flexed upwards to allow the tip of it to pass over the retinoids and into the upper trachea. Once in the trachea, the balloon is gently inflated until a small crescent is visualized. Overinflation of the balloon is unnecessary and may limit airflow around the scope, especially in the main bronchi. A systematic ultrasound survey is then performed. We typically start by examining the 11L station then slowly withdraw the scope to the left tracheobronchial angle where the left main pulmonary artery and ascending aorta are visualized with the 4L nodes residing between them. The scope is then withdrawn proximally along the left side of the trachea keeping the aorta in view and noting the takeoff of the innominate artery. Station 2L is examined. Note the importance of slow rotational sweeps as the scope is slowly moved proximally to interrogate the paratracheal space. The scope is rotated to the right side of the trachea, keeping the artery in view. This allows visualization of the 2R station. Next, the carina is identified under white light, and the scope passed into the right main bronchus and rotated to face the medial aspect of the right main bronchus where the subcarinal node will be seen. Occasionally, visualization of the station 7 node is better from the left main bronchus. Finally, the 11R station is examined and the scope is then slowly withdrawn to the right tracheobronchial angle where the 4R nodes are identified proximal to the azagous vein. Normal anatomic landmarks visible on white light bronchoscopy will help the operator determine the correct orientation and position of the scope. At each station, the diameter of the lymph node is recorded. For lung cancer staging, nodes 5 mm in size or greater are biopsied. The ultrasound survey helps define the order in which nodal stations will be biopsied, allows assistants to prepare and label slides, and ensures a logical sequence of nodal sampling from contralateral to ipsilateral mediastinal, and finally to ipsilateral hilar. A 21 or 22 gauge flexible biopsy needle is passed through the biopsy channel and secured to the bronchoscope by a flange. Take care to check that the needle is fully retracted before insertion, and that the bronchoscope is in a neutral position. Otherwise, the stiffness of the sheath may damage the delicate inner coating of the biopsy channel if the scope is in a flexed position. One may lose the ultrasound image while passing the needle, but in most cases, once the needle is seated, the ultrasound image can be re-established. The exception to this is the occasional instance when extreme flexion is required to visualize the target node. This occurs most often at the 4L nodal station because of the near right angle takeoff of the left main bronchus with the trachea. When the sheath is in place, it limits the degree of flexion possible by the scope. 
Additional inflation of the balloon may sometimes compensate and allow the image to be restored, but often the scope has to be retracted slightly and the node sampled from a more proximal position. To avoid damaging the bronchoscope, it's imperative that the needle not be deployed until the tip of the sheath has been positioned outside the end of the bronchoscope. To do this, the sheath screw is loosened and the sheath is carefully advanced until the tip is just visible on the white light image. It's important not to advance too much of the sheath as it will interfere with the quality of the ultrasound image by pushing the wall of the airway away from the transducer. Once a millimeter or two of sheath is outside the bronchoscope, the sheath is locked in place. One will notice that when the needle is first advanced, that it drags some of the sheath out the bronchoscope along with it, which can lead to inaccurate needle placement and degradation of the ultrasound image. It is therefore ideal to have the tip of the needle just at the end of the sheath so that this latent drag effect does not occur. One method of doing this is to begin slowly advancing the needle, keeping a careful eye on the sheath as it begins to creep out of the bronchoscope. As it advances, a subtle downward dip or deflection of the sheath will occur. At this point, the needle tip lies just behind the end of the sheath, and further advancement of the needle will not cause any more of the sheath to be pushed out of the bronchoscope. With the needle and sheath in this position, the sheath can then be carefully retracted back into the bronchoscope, the needle along with it, until the tip is just visible in the white light image. The needle is now set and the target node can be located again using ultrasound. Mucus, blood, or other airway debris can sometimes make it impossible to obtain a clear image of the sheath. In this case, one can ensure that the sheath is out of the end of the bronchoscope by moving it in and out of the bronchoscope and observing the distortion of the ultrasound image at the upper right-hand corner. This is caused by the end of the sheath pushing against the airway wall. Under direct ultrascopic visualization, the needle is advanced across the airway wall and into the lymph node. There are a couple of points that are worth noting about needle deployment. First, with the stylet fully hubbed, the tip of the needle appears blunt. Therefore, retracting the stylet one or two millimeters prior to performing the puncture presents a sharper end to the needle that will help transit. Second, it is not infrequent that the needle will encounter cartilage. Advancing the needle with a quick and forceful jab often allows the needle to penetrate the tissue better than a slow and steady advance, which often just succeeds in pushing the wall of the airway further away from the transducer with consequent loss of image. Should this occur, it's often helpful to have an assistant hold the bronchoscope at the level of the endotracheal tube, or LMA, and push it deeper into the airway while the operator maintains the needle in the deployed position. Once the needle has entered the lymph node, it is sometimes necessary to make fine rotational adjustments to the scope to optimize the image. The entire length of the needle within the node should be visualized. If excessive sheath has also advanced during needle deployment, which can sometimes lessen the image quality, the sheath may be carefully retracted until an optimal image is regained. By default, the needle will advance two centimeters from the end of the sheath, and for most applications this is sufficient. A removable stop can be detached, which allows the needle to extend an additional two centimeters into the lymph node. This is useful in biopsying larger lymph nodes. Once in the node, the stylet is agitated to push any retained bronchial epithelium or cartilaginous debris out of the needle lumen. The stylet is then withdrawn and the needle is plunged in and out of the lymph node 10 to 15 times. It's the rapid downstroke that results in the cutting action required to liberate cellular material. The needle should be passed across the entire node from cortex to cortex, as the subcortical regions often harbor metastases. By stabilizing the operating hand on the bronchoscope using the fourth and fifth digits, the thumb and index finger can be used to move the needle in a controlled and accurate manner. Use of suction is controversial. The downside of suction is that it results in a more bloody aspirate, particularly in vascular nodes, such as those in the subcranial space. The more blood in the aspirate, the more hemodilution there will be of lymphocytes and the more clot in the specimen, both of which hinder cytologic interpretation. However, more material can be obtained using suction, and for small or fibrotic nodes, it is often required. If suction is used, no more than one or two cc's of negative pressure should be applied. If no suction is used, the specimen tends to be less bloody and there's greater purity of the sample. However, the amount of specimen is generally smaller. We often perform the first pass at each station without suction and then apply it. When using suction, it's important to remember to release the negative pressure before withdrawing the needle. Otherwise, bronchial epithelium and other debris may be suctioned into the specimen as the needle traverses the airway wall. Once the aspirate has been obtained, the needle is fully withdrawn back into the sheath, then taken out of the bronchoscope and handed to the assistant. 
It's often helpful to rotate two needles so that one may be used by the operator while the specimen is being removed from the other one. At least three separate punctures per nodal station are performed. Thus, for a staging procedure where four or five separate nodal stations may be examined, as many as 12 to 20 punctures will be routinely performed. This is one of the reasons why we prefer to perform these procedures under a general anesthetic. Efficient specimen handling is vital. Once obtained, the specimen should be quickly handed off to the assistant who advances the needle from the sheath. The stylet is reinserted, which pushes aspirated material out of the needle. A single drop of aspirate should be placed at one end of the label slide, and another spreader slide used to smoothly create a monolayer of cells. The non-spreader slide is placed into a fixative solution that lyses red blood cells. The other is allowed to air dry and will be used for rapid H&E staining to ensure specimen adequacy. The remaining specimen is placed in RPMI solution so that a cell block can be made. Once the specimen has been removed, the needle is flushed with heparinized saline and then air. It's then ready to be used again. Squash or lift preparations, traditional blood smear techniques, smearing the same area of the slide twice, use of excessive pressure or use of two fully frosted slides, and delay in getting the smears into fixative solution should be avoided. It is ideal, though not necessary, to have rapid on-site cytologic evaluation, or ROSE, of the aspirate so that stations with inadequate specimen may be resampled. Additionally, the finding of a positive nodal station, for instance a contralateral N3 station, may negate the need to perform additional biopsies of more proximal stations. Regardless of whether ROSE is available, it's a useful thing for the operator to examine the specimens that they have obtained with the cytopathologist as it provides a useful learning feedback loop.